Thank you. Thank you, Tuka, for the kind introduction. Thanks, Qt, for the very warm welcome for all of us. It's great. It's wonderful to be here and share with you a little bit my point of view of design. Now, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, design previously. You all work with di designers together. And I thought today it might be interesting for you to hear from me the beginning of the beginning of a design or the thinking before the thinking before the start then because you know there is something very magic about design and uh, the question always then at the end is what makes a good design from a bad design as we heard before um, at the end, it's a kind of taste, but design is much, much more than just taste, you know? The taste is just artificial. There's much more hidden in the design and in the first thoughts to create a strong bond between the object and the person who is looking to that object. The first glimpse, the first touch of the eyes with, the, with this object, you know? These are the seconds of a very, very strong emotional impact. And they, at the end, uh, are the basis why people like or don't like something, or what people judge as good or bad design. Now, I call this the invisible touch. And this is um, what I would like to talk to you. And of course, my roots are automotive. I'm a typical automotive designer, so please allow me to talk a little bit about cars. Uh, but also I would like to share with you later some other products. Yeah, the invisible touch, what is it? Now, um, when Picasso was doing these kind of paintings in his certain period, People asked him why he was painting the face of the person from the front and the side at the same time. And he said, I'm painting this because my model is always moving. And I try to adapt this movement onto this canvas, onto this two-dimensional, you know, paper to implement this movement and to have it in my paintings. Now, this constant movement is the, one of the core elements of automotive design, which makes a car completely different from any other product to be designed. Because a car is always moving, and people judge a car by its movement. Even a car is not moving, it is moving, because it's outside. The clouds, the sun, the moon, the lights of the street, the shadow of the trees, everything builds reflection onto a car. So a car is constantly in a movement and plays with shadow and light. And to create this surfacing, that the surfaces take this movement, these reflections, is one of the core skills of a car designer. And to do this in a way that it always looks, you know, nice and well and well made. This is a very hard skill to do. Now, but there is another invisible touch in cars, which is very, very deeply anchored in, in the people. This is the relation to a horse. Now, the horse was the first product, if you want, that brought people from one point to the other. It was the first transportation tool, if you wish. And the car is very similar, you know? People feed their car because they give gasoline or battery. They strike, they stroke them because they wash it. And sometimes it sleeps, you know, next to it in the garage. So the relations to a horse are still there and are very, very strong in ourselves. And you know very well that even people give car names to their cars and 
There are people, you know, they say, I love my car, which is a very human thing to say to an object. So the relation between a human and a product like a car is very, very deep in us. And this makes a car a very special product. And it's not only on the exterior. It, of course, continues on all the interior pieces. So there is something which is very bonded to us since we are a child. I mean, everybody in a carousel drove you know, with something like that. It was his first time when he sat in an object. He, had, he or she had the feeling he is conducting himself, moving, you know, doing something, having the air, you know, being looked at, looking outside. And later, you know, we play with these toys. This is Gordon Murray. And, you know, enjoy ourselves with the movement. The movement is such a strong element in our desire. Yeah, and um, you might know that, you know, the, we have a big renaissance of old timers and old cars because people are going back to the simplicity, you know. Today there is an overload of information, you know, of goodies, you know, of tools and everything. And a lot of people are uh, tired of this overloading. And we have a renaissance, if you want, back to the simplicity, and it's also shown in, in products like the car. So, in this sense, a car is one of the most emotional products in the world, and it's something that concerns everybody. There is a big difference between any other product that can be designed or engineered or produced compared to a car, in the sense that if you take any other product, you like it, you want to have it, you buy it, and you bring it to somewhere, and if you like, your friends see it or you show it to your family or whatever, and if, if not, you keep it for yourself. You can't do this with a car, because with a car you are always visible. Everybody sees you in the car, if you like or not. They compare you with the product, they build images of you, they reflect who you might be, what you might be, if you are... That's is Jahrhundert. You know, that this, is, this, is, this is what, what the car is today, still today for the people. I come to the changes later. Yeah? But this is the base of the strong bond of the people, and this is the reason why so many people um, have problems to let, let it go. There is no rational thinking behind. Everybody thinks of kind of freedom with a car still, even if it's not anymore. I mean, you just have to go into the big cities. But there is the notion, this, this feeling of freedom. But this notion of freedom is not only in cars. It's also a matter of success for other products. Everybody is looking for kind of freedom, for simplicity. I mean, we have heard before that when products get technically more and more complicated, you know, better and better, but more and more complicated, sometimes they lose their soul and they lose, you know, what, what is really the interaction with the customer. I will show you some examples uh, from the market. There was a time when every household had a radio like this one up there, uh, mostly in the living room, and um, especially in America, you know, it was a habit that uh, after the lunch on Sundays or in the evenings, the family came to come together and were listening to the news on this radio together uh, or some music or whatever. When the rock and roll music came up, suddenly there was a, a disruptive element because the young people, they wanted to hear this new music and the parents thought that's really terrible, you know, too loud and, you know, they didn't understand. So they started a little conflict, how to use this device at home. Um, and then the transistor radio came out, designed in a very simple way. I mean, it had very bad sound. It had very bad receive. Uh, the batteries were melting. The thing was broke all the time. But it was a huge success. 
because suddenly the young people had something where they could go out into the park and, and you know, listen to what they wanted to listen and did give them a freedom, another kind of freedom, another kind of aspect which was much more important than the quality of the product itself. And most of you know the Walkman, when the Walkman came out, it was a very similar story. The sound was terrible, you had to put things in your ear, you know, but it gave the people freedom and simplicity to enjoy what they liked in a very, very easy way. It's very similar with the cameras. I mean, Germany was a leading nation for high-quality cameras, you know, Spiegel reflex cameras. And it got better and better and better and better. It was, you know, a masterpiece. They have been masterpieces. And then the digital camera came out, and it was, a, I mean, from the photo quality, it was a disaster. You know, uh, the, the colors were wrong. <laughs> you know, too many pixels. It had no technical, co it could not compete technically with a Spiegel reflex camera. But suddenly, the people could print their own photos. And they could share with their friends when they have been to visit. And they could look immediately. And they did not have to wait, you know, for a week or days to get the film back from a professional filmmaker and then maybe everything was black, I don't know. So suddenly, another function a function of the user experience gets more important than the real technical quality and brings, you know, a new product alive and at the end overwhelms the old traditional perfection. If you want, it's an imperfect perfection what, you know, creates a huge market, new products, same with the iPhone, we heard it before, you know, when, when the computers, and before you had, the, you had the string, you could, could not go far away, and then the, the string got longer and longer and longer, and then, you know, um, and now we have a, a little machine in our pocket, and we can talk to all over the world, and, you know, it's a freedom, it's a kind of freedom. This, of course, has a lot of impact on the, on the way we are work now, and, you know, I mean, it's not long ago then this was a typical room of a chief, of a director, you know. Lots of wood, a heavy chair, long distance to the door, you know. The, the poor guy had to come a long way to talk to his uh, chief, you know, with lots of respect. And this is the today's world, you know. Small, flexible, easy, connected, networked, you know, a community. And these habits are a base that a lot of things change and, you know, open up the space to create new products. These things are out, you know, nobody, at least here in this uh, Europe region, would go with a killed animal to an opera to show himself. And, you know, these kind of uh, Rolex watches with lots of glamour you can buy, you know, in China for uh, five euro. So, the, the things where people want to show themselves, where they want to present themselves, is changing. It's changing in an, an awareness of, you know, environmental, careful, looking to our resources, to think, you know, what's really needed, not to waste things which, which you know, just are not necessary. The green life is, you know, a part of our very strong conscious and, you know, it, it makes people aware that we have to be careful anyhow. And of course, this is influencing the transportation design and the car design, you know, while car companies uh, are still sticking on their business case because they don't want to risk and they don't want to fail. It, these are free thinkers who come with new ideas, with new products, who dare and, you also, and they also dare maybe to fail, you know? I always encourage my people that they dare to fail. It's not that they should fail, but to dare to fail is a very strong habitude. Because if you don't dare to fail, then you become average, and you try to please everybody, and you try to be a good team member, and this is not what I think is good for a designer. That's my personal point of view. So these people, you know, they dare, and new things coming up, this is an example of the city of uh, London, 
uh, it's a project from uh, Sir Norman Foster, where uh, new infrastructure is created to implement new transportation. Now here is the idea to make uh, over the tram rails from the suburbs to London a second level of a street which is dedicated to bikes, to bicycles, to e-bikes. Projects like this are growing now in a lot of capitals in the world to decrease the cars in the cities, to decrease the noise, to decrease the pollution, and give the people also a little bit more health when they're moving. Of course, you know, if you do such infrastructure, then the question is, is a bike enough to transport? Because bike is wonderful, but at least it has no protection. You have to go alone. Uh, when it rains, it becomes problematic. When somebody wants to go to work and has a nice dress. So we are talking a lot about and working a lot about the new transportation of the future. And the new transportation of the future is not cars. And what we believe also not electrical cars, because they, they are cars. They will take the same space. They will cause the same traffic jams. So this is not the solution. And if infrastructure like this will change, there might be complete new vehicles come onto the market, like our Ono or Tradebox, which is basically a bike for two people with the skin out of textile. So there's no sheet metal, nothing. It's just a soft skin uh, where people go pedaling and with electrical engine to work on the new infrastructure of the cities, silent, pollution-free, you know, and for good health for the people. Another project I would like to show you, this is a, a, a cargo bike, uh, which we just presented last week here in Berlin to the press as a prototype, which uh, hopefully will come out onto the market coming year. And here is also the idea to simplify the life in the cities because this product is a three-wheeled bike with a cargo box at the back to load uh, 300 kilo of packages to uh, leave the cities out of the vans and trucks which bring the packages to the homes. Only in Germany last year, there have been three and a half billion billion packages transported to the homes of the people. Traffic jams have been produced, pollution has been produced, you know, wasted energy. And we hope with this little bike to help to solve the situation in the cities to make a better life. And here I would like to show you a little bit how we work with our design skills and, you know, with the computers and just take you through the process of how we do work. We always start with a kind of tape drawing. What you see on the back, it is a full-size image, a full-size character of the designer uh, to create the first volume proportion of what it is. I mean, here we compared, of course, with bikes. Uh, we wanted to have a bike seating position that the person who is delivering the packages can go out and in easily. He has to go out and in about 100 times a day. Um, so the designer is, you know, is starting to create a kind of feeling what he would like to have, a frame, a signature. Um, and then we design more and more in detail, you know, put in the right proportions, a lot of detailing how the materials could put together. And in this stage, the designer starts to communicate with the, his colleague on the computer to implement the sketches and his ideas and his feelings onto the computer. We work with Alias and um, SolidWorks to make you know, this, this link between the real product with the technical constraints and the feeling. Same time, a lot of mock-ups are built to test you know, the, the view outside in a very simple way with wood and cardboard, you know, easy going to try to get in and out, and always complemented the changes on the full-size tape drawing to have the reflection. So it's a tape drawing, the mock-up, 
and the computer. The computer helps us a lot, you know, to put in all the supplier parts, to put in, you know, the, the registration things, and slowly and slowly the project is growing, and at the end, on the alias, we do kind of, you know, a final rendering to see how this thing will look like when it's completed. Same time, they are very rudimentary, very simple test drives uh, to uh, have the fourth part on this project, you know, how it feels, how, it, how it's going, uphill, downhill, braking, and all this kind of stuff. And then, of course, a lot of detail work, like here the front, the top part sitting on the lower part, coloring it in, and giving so slowly and slowly the complete picture of the vehicle, which is at the end a real 3D volume uh, that we can turn, of course, we can, you know, explore, look inside, and um, yeah, work on it on detail. This is basically the way of process how we work when we create a, a car design or a, a mobility design. Always this link between the sketch, the computer, the mock-up, and the driving first driving. Um, impressions. Yeah. The question is, you know, how will we develop this process of work? Uh, you know, a lot of things are changing. A lot of new technologies come up. You've heard a lot this morning. Uh, our work is very much like a teamwork, you know. Uh, a, an object like a, like a car or like a mobility vehicle is after all an object that we have always to see in one-to-one. -one. So we are working on systems where we will try to make a full screen glass. It's just a glass. On that we project what we create and we wish to talk to the machine not to push or to take the mouse, to talk while we are creating it. And on the screen, we want to see what's happening. So we want to come to the point where we can say, bring me the surface A out, you know, keep it in, put some light on, put the shadow on, and it happens on real time in front of us, uh, full size. So we can stay around, we can walk around, we can talk. We did a lot of experiments with the 3D glasses it did not satisfy us so far because uh, the communication is very difficult when everybody has such a thing in front of himself. And eventually, eventually we would like, we are working with some big car companies to develop the next step, which means that we have friends, you know, machine friends. They will, on real time, work on the real object while we are creating it. And why we are doing this? Because we want to have free our minds to be creative and not so much time to uh, spend, you know, to, to make it real. And this is the kind of next steps we are working on. So, of course, this is a bit far away and it's very specific to our business. And maybe one or the other of you might say, uh, well, if this will happen, I don't know. It's, I don't know if some of you have doubts or so. I, I just wanted to, would like to show you something to end up with, which um, I think is quite important to share with you. I mean, uh, these are the, the brother Wright. When they did their first, first flight with a machine, uh, the flight took 12 seconds, people say. It was the first time that people could, you know, lift off the ground and fly. Um, I imagine in my, my uh, imagination that, you know, after the 12 seconds, this thing crashed. You know, it was very fragile, maybe it broke. And the two brothers, you know, they, you know, I have the picture in front of me, they lay in the grass, you know, they look to the sky and are, you know, really excited that it, this happened and they dream, you know, and they dream and think, wow, if it, will be po if it will be possible that one day, you know, people will fly from one point to the other, from one state to the other, you know, they lay in the sun, they dream, and 
the funny thing is, or the interesting thing is, that it takes not longer than more than six, 60 years only that the first person is on the moon. And you know, 60 years, it's my age, so it's not, it's not that uh, long. And I just want to give you this as a personal input, you know, that whatever you can imagine, you can do. And this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, thank you. <clears throat> we actually have time for a question. Uh, is there uh, any volunteers? I can start with one. I'm curious about this traditional design that you do, which is very much based on form factor and, and, and the physical usability. And for instance, you worked a lot with car design, and that also goes inside the car. So how do you see now when technology is, in a way, revolutionizing the usage of, for instance, cars? And you, know, you, you don't have physical controls anymore but a lot of that functionality comes from software side. So how do you incorporate that and integrate that into the design process? That is that fundamental part of it, or is it that, okay, that's gonna be handled with software somewhere, so we'll just focus on the other things? Yeah, it's, um, it's more and more the most important question, basically, because before the software, which could create these beautiful interiors on the dashboards, uh, the interior was uh, di uh, dictated by the technical possibilities, you know, by the digitals, by the mechanic, uh, and with the software, basically the designer can create whatever he wants to create. So it is an immense freedom that opens up, you know, unexpected possibilities. And of course, the importance in that sense is, as we heard before, that there is a very, very strong link to the customer, to the user, because it has to be, after all, it has to be served to the user, and he must understand it, he must like it, he needs, you know, he must be thrilled by it in a positive way. And this uh, is a complete new way of designing the interior of cars, and a lot of car companies are forcing or growing this uh, interface design department. And it's thanks to you, yeah? I mean, without, <laughs> without you, and your, with you would be not possible. All right, thank you. Um, I think I stole the whole time for questions, but that's the perks of being an MC, so. <laughs> Sorry for that, but thank you again. Thank you very that. much. Thank you. Have a great time. Thank you.